Welcome to Talk to Al Jazeera. I'm Mike Hanna in Doha. In a very short while, the greatest sports event ever held on the African continent gets underway. The 2010 Football World Cup will begin with a match between South Africa and Mexico. It's the first time this has ever been staged on the continent. And with me, the man who played a major role in bringing this event to Africa, the then President of South Africa, Thabo Mbeki. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Mike. I'd like to quote from a letter that you sent to Seth Blatter right at the beginning of the process. And in that letter, you said, we want to ensure that one day historians will reflect on the 2010 World Cup as the moment when Africa stood tall and resolutely turned the tide on centuries of poverty and conflict. From the beginning, this was never about sport, was it? It was about sport, but uh, sport uh, uh, as a vehicle, particularly soccer, uh, as a vehicle to make a particular statement about the continent. We uh, uh, indeed saw it as, a, as an important opportunity when, uh, when Africa would join the rest of the world as an equal. Uh, and given, given the very widespread support for soccer, that this would be a message and that would be carried to, to billions of people across the globe, in a sense that, uh, that Africa had arrived. A and we thought it was very important, particularly in the context that we were talking uh, about an African renaissance and the, 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 the certainty of uh, the Africans claiming the 21st century. Now, an even earlier part of this process, perhaps, was the movement of your own country toward democracy. The liberation of South Africa was an important stage in the um, liberation of the continent as a whole, paving the way for your vision of an African renaissance. Do you see it like that? Yes, certainly. I mean, certainly it was that. You might remember that uh, <coughs> uh, when Nelson Mandela attended his first uh, summit meeting of the Organization of African Unity, uh, that summit was held in Tunis, in Tunisia. And of course, the, it being the first, we had this particular challenge of thinking together with him, what would he say in this first speech uh, to the continent as, as, an, as, as president of an independent South Africa. And, uh, and we, we then remembered that uh, uh, Tunis is Carthage. And so said, so he said, uh, we are in Carthage, which was destroyed by the Romans many centuries ago when they said Cartago de Lenda Est. And now that South Africa is free, we have come, Africa has arrived at the point to rebuild Carthage. So indeed, that's what South Africa, the, the liberation of South Africa meant to the continent. This, uh, the time had come for itself to reconstruct itself after this millennia uh, of destructions which started with the discussion of destruction of Carthage. So indeed it was that, the liberation of South Africa was that, a, a signal that the continent would now tackle this, this important challenge of, of rebuilding of rebuilding itself. The phrase talking to the enemy has become almost a cliche now, yet you were somebody who was very involved in that from the beginning, the issue of dialogue with those who you are opposed to and who are opposed to you. How important is dialogue and how much of an example can the South African process offer to places in which no dialogue exists? It is important, I think, that uh, <coughs> And people who are leaders, who claim to be leaders, uh, I, in, a, in situations of conflict, I, I would imagine that one of the things that a leader would say is uh, what, what should we do, what can we do to bring about change without imposing too high a price on the people? What is it that you can do if people are oppressed? Indeed, you must end the oppression. But, uh, at least cost in terms of lives and so on, because in the end, uh, it's only the ordinary people who suffer most from that. I, I think that as, 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 as a leader, 
one has got a responsibility to, to do that. It's like an army general. An army general must uh, command the troops to fight a war, but the army general must say, sure, because it's war, some of the soldiers will die, but I must minimize the cost, minimize the number of dead. Uh, and so indeed, uh, uh, I think one should always choose to talk. That doesn't mean that it is possible to, to talk to the enemy all the time, but then one must always choose to talk. And, uh, and I think those who stand to suffer most in terms of conflicts have the greater obligation uh, to create the possibility to talk and resolve questions through negotiations. Certainly in our case, uh, that this, this was so. Uh, and so we, uh, uh, we had to find ways uh, to talk to the enemy. And of course, among other things, that meant uh, you've got to be patient uh, to convince this person that uh, you are worth talking to, uh, to convince this person that uh, the talking uh, is not threatening, that the, 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 the solutions that are being sought uh, are not destructive of the other person to whom you are talking. Uh, so I'm saying that it's, it's the ones who would suffer most, who I think uh, have the biggest challenge to, to find ways to persuade the enemy, to persuade the enemy to engage in discussion, simply because uh, you're the one who would pay the highest price if there is no talking. But it went even further than that. In the first democratic administration of South Africa, you were deputy president, and alongside you, the president of the apartheid republic as a fellow deputy president for much of that first term. How important was that, the actual physical manifestation of a dialogue come to fruition? Well, it was important. I mean, we, it was important. We assumed that, indeed, uh, you could get the political leadership uh, of, in this case, the white South African population. You could get the political leadership to understand the need for change, the need for peaceful coexistence, the need to create a non-racial South Africa. But that didn't mean that necessarily the entirety uh, of the population that that leadership represent, represented understood that. That uh, we, sh we should expect that there would be a, a, a significant residue of the attitudes of the past uh, of, of, of wanting to continue to oppress or, or wanting to continue to the, the conflict in order to guarantee that oppression. A, and therefore, the, the fact that you sit together in one government with their leaders, it, it serves as reassurance to these other people who would say, well, there our leaders are sitting now with our erstwhile enemy. Uh, surely, as they sit there, they are taking care of our interests. And surely we know them, these are our leaders, they wouldn't do anything that is foolish. Now, you took over from a person who epitomized the South African struggle, Nelson Mandela. How difficult was that? I don't think it was particularly difficult. You see what had happened, part of what had happened, is that uh, uh, in reality, during these five years uh, in which he was president, uh, Nelson Mandela, quite deliberately, quite consciously, uh, said uh, uh, he, he would really li li leave the business of government largely uh, to me, because he thought that uh, what he needed to do was the, the, the larger thing, uh, to continue to communicate to the population as a whole about the larger issues, about reconciliation, uh, uh, to, uh, to attend to those, to those larger matters, as I was saying, to reassure everybody about the future. Uh, but that the, the daily business of running government, therefore he would, he would, he would leave to us. So, uh, so that by the time I became president five years later, uh, well, I was doing work that I'd been doing anyway. The period of your presidency saw the 
largest period of economic growth in South Africa since the war. And yet, even within the ANC itself, there were elements, there were alliance partners, particularly the trade unions, who still criticized you as leader of government for economic policies that they could not agree with. Was this difficult to reconcile? Well, yes. I mean, the, the, uh, <coughs> uh, there were debates, and there are continuing debates, about the same things to this day about economic policy. Uh, and I, I think, uh, in good measure, this, this arose because of, um, uh, in many instances, lack of understanding. In many instances, lack of understanding of uh, economic imperatives. Uh, for instance, when we, we said we, we needed to make some uh, changes in policy to address issues of uh, the budget deficit, about interest rates, and questions of this kind, uh, to, to, to deal with issues of macroeconomic policy. That is the one issue that raised a lot of debate, uh, essentially because I think of a misunderstanding uh, of, uh, of, for instance, what, what Keynes had said about uh, 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 budget deficits and the role that they play in terms of economic growth and economic development, etc. So when we're saying uh, it's important to cut down these budget deficits, uh, to bring them to, um, to manageable levels, the, the argument was that, no, but uh, why are you doing that? Uh, because you need to increase those deficits in order to generate more resources, in order to put those resources into development, etc. Uh, but the problem, of course, uh, which we understood very well, was that uh, there would come a time if you didn't manage those budget deficits down, that indeed you're going to end up having a situation where you've got to borrow money in order to pay the people from whom would borrow the money from. You'd end up uh, raising taxes in order to pay the bankers. As has happened in a number of countries. As, as has happened. I think the, 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 the uh, current example of Greece is exactly that. We refuse to go that route because it really clearly, I mean, we understood that if we went that route and already when we came into government, you had a budget deficit which was something in the order of 10 percent uh, of the gross domestic product. And, it, and we saw that if we don't change it, we are going to get into this debt trap. But I'm saying there are people within the broad movement who didn't understand that, uh, who thought that, uh, you know, you, quite correctly, we needed more resources in order to impact on poverty, on building of houses and clinics and roads and all of these things. So we needed more resources, but the way to get those resources was not by borrowing. Uh, but uh, uh, it's, it's just, uh, 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 I think, a level of uh, understanding about these economic imperatives which, uh, which caused the debate. There were the other issues that appeared to be misunderstood during your presidency. A time of regenerating a society that was still in development areas of health and of education. And specifically, you came under particular criticism for the issue of HIV AIDS and the delay in introducing retrovirals. Well, uh, I, I think there was uh, a lot of misunderstanding. Um, <coughs> you see, the South African government policy from then to date uh, was always based on this uh, thesis that uh, HIV causes AIDS. And therefore, there were established responses uh, to that globally. Uh, and South African government policy on this matter of HIV and AIDS has always been like that uh, from the beginning. So uh, what then happened uh, was that I raised some issues to say, but there are some issues that we, we needed to understand better. In a situation in which everybody was reporting that the country had a very high incidence of, of HIV, uh, and therefore this was a serious problem. And so I said, look, then uh, it's necessary that we must understand this thing better so that we respond better to what is a major crisis. And so raised questions uh, about this from what I could see. We didn't change 
uh, government programs with regard to treatment, prevention, and so on, because I was raising these questions. But so, uh, but you've then had this interpretation that uh, uh, because we're raising these questions, saying, but uh, why don't we look closer at these various matters? Therefore, there are certain things that the government government didn't do as part of its policy, and I don't believe that that is true. You had a problem, uh, which again has arisen, uh, that uh, yes, indeed, the generally accepted approach was that there were these antiretroviral drugs which you would use to treat people. Uh, but then one of the matters that we had to attend to was the cost. The cost of this, what would be the cost of this if we did this with regard to the health budget generally? And it was quite clear that uh, if you just concentrated on that, then you'd have no money to spend on TB, you'd have no money to spend on diabetes, and, and so on. That issue is still with us today. The matter has been raised again by the current government in South Africa, but they've looked at this thing, and, and it seems to them that they have to study this matter again, uh, because uh, the, even with the reduced prices uh, of the antiretroviral drugs now, relative to what they were then, even with that reduction, there's still this challenge of how you manage uh, the money that you have, bearing in mind the, the burden of disease. The country carries the biggest killer. The big, biggest killer in South Africa now is TB. Um, so uh, it would be rational for a Minister of Health to say, Yes, of course, we've got to attend to the matter of HIV and AIDS. But the disease that kills the greatest number of people in South Africa is TB. So you've got to do something about it and allocate necessary resources. If this was a challenge then, it remains a challenge now. Your position on it was politically unpopular among segments of the community and of, of, of the um, movement itself, of the ANC, as was your position on, on certain issues of, of, of economics. When you were recalled by the ANC, you wrote a letter to Cabinet that I'd like to quote a, a section of it. Confronted by the reality that as government we must govern and therefore take decisions that have a national, structural and long-term impact, we have consequently had the task to relate the subjective to the objective, to find the necessary relationship between theory and practice. Are you referring there to the difficulty of being in government? at the same time being a member of a political movement. Is it possible to separate out government and political organization? And is it necessary in a democracy? No, it's, it's, the, uh, <coughs> it's, it's to balance, to, to deal with uh, the issue of the dreams <laughs> that I have and the capacity to bring those dreams into reality. Uh, I might wish, I might wish uh, for something which is, which is excellent. I, I wish that all uh, young people graduating from high school have, uh, graduate with mathematics as one of their subjects. And indeed, uh, you would applaud that. This is excellent. I mean, this reflects uh, what modern society needs. But that's my dream. But how practical is it? Uh, and you can't say that uh, because the dream has not been realized, therefore there's a failure. No, that's what I was talking about. That, uh, uh, of course, as uh, political organizations, as individuals, we've got a great, great vision about our future and great hopes which we advance and, and, and people develop these things into slogans. Free education for all, up to a uh, university level. Oh, it's a lovely vision. But how practicable is it? And so you've got to come down to this point of saying, wha what is objective reality? What is cap the capacity? And you've got to, need to take that objective reality uh, or take your subjective desires and measure against them against objective reality to tell you what it is that you've got to do. And as government, and as government, you can't. You can't be driven just by these, these beautiful wishes and dreams that one has, they've got to be tempered, uh, those, those dreams and wishes, by, by, by what is realizable. Is this part of the growth of democracy, part of 
a democratic process in a very young country the realization of the realities that face government as opposed to political movements? <clears throat> no, Mike, I think that uh, in the most important uh, matter that attaches to that is leadership. You see, uh, it's, it's, it's quite easy, it's very easy uh, for anybody to take uh, populist positions. Uh, indeed, the people there are demanding, uh, they let there be a house for everybody uh, tomorrow. It's quite easy for me to stand up to say, I, uh, I love you very much and I will make sure that you get a house tomorrow and indeed get a standing ovation. But you can't deliver on a promise like that. So the challenge of leadership becomes that you go to these people to say, I, I perfectly understand the desire for everybody to have a, a, a lovely house, but it's not going to happen. And the reason it's not going to happen is not because we don't desire it, but because we don't have this practical capacity. It's, it's a, I was raising that in that context uh, because uh, it's, uh, as I say, it's quite easy um, to, to make these promises which, uh, which are unrealizable. Unreali uh, and, uh, and for at the moment you make them, you, you might indeed uh, gain a great deal of popularity. But in the end, uh, the chickens will come home to roost because uh, actual capacity, objective reality will, will communicate another message that uh, you don't have the means to fulfill this promise that you made to the people and that's when trouble starts. Is that a danger in South Africa today? Well, I don't know. I, I, I would hope not. Uh, I would hope not because I think uh, we, the, we, we, the country has the experience in any case has been that in reality, the fundamentals of the policies that were put in place in 94 haven't changed. Uh, fundamentals with regard to the democratization process, with regard to the economy, with regard to social policy and all of that. Fundamentally, policy hasn't changed. Uh, the present government is also uh, uh, is, is proceeding on the basis essentially of, of this policy. So I, I wouldn't imagine that uh, there's anything that has happened policy-wise which constitutes uh, uh, the government overreaching itself in terms of what it promises. Uh, I would imagine that that's not the case. Certainly from a policy position, uh, that there's nothing in the policy which would result in that. Tabu and Becky, thank you very much indeed. I'm Mike Hanna in Doha. Thank you very much for watching Talk to Al Jazeera. <laughs>